as well. It's really amazing to be in such a wonderful surroundings. Um, so yeah, my, the title of my talk is um, Graph Complexes. Uh, which relates uh, three different three different things, but in reality, uh, the purpose of my talk is to break five different things. So here's a sort of um, <clears throat> overview of the, the topics I want to discuss. Um, in no particular order, we have uh, graph complexes, even commutative graph complex. Um, <clears throat> this is some something in homological algebra. It's related to the, um, it, its cohomology is, is related to the geometry of certain moduli spaces of moduli space of tropical curves <coughs> in G trop. Um, then moduli space of tropical curves is related to the cohomology of GLN, which is something important in, in number theory and algebraic K theory and so on. And uh, what I'm going to do in this talk is to study the geometry of this space uh, using uh, Durham theory, which is appropriate since we're in the Swiss mountains, famous uh, Swiss mountaineer, of course, Charles Durham. Um, so I want to study differential forms on this space which come from the general linear group. Um, and that's going to give us things which we can integrate which produces multiple zeta values and Feynman integrals, um, which is something studied intensively in high energy physics, and uh, brings us back to GRT, of course, which is in the title. All these um, topics are, are, are related to each other, but I'd like to say they're very closely related. These are not sort of superficial connections, they're very deep connections between these subjects. So I want to take a tour of these and hopefully I will cover all of them. Um, so the first is graph homology. I'm sure it's familiar to everybody. So I'm going to consider uh, G pairs, G eta, where G is a finite connected graph. And eta is an orientation. This sort of simplistic way to think of an orientation is just a, a sign. Uh, it's a sign times uh, the exterior product of all the edges. So if the graph has edges e1 up to en, you, the orientation is given by either plus or minus the wedge product of the edges in some order. And the point is that if you change the order of the edges, if you interchange two edges, the orientation flips by a minus sign. So they're just graphs um, with, with a sign, and G has uh, no uh, self edges. So no, no, it's tadpoles in physics because they look a bit like tadpoles, um, and no uh, vertices of uh, degree less than equal to two, for example, things like this. And then we say um, the equivalent of class G eta is an oriented graph modular relation, where the relation is that if you reverse the sign of the orientation, then you reverse the, the, the class. The oriented graph minus itself for the opposite orientation. And if we have um, an isomorphism of two graphs, then uh, G eta is the same as G prime sigma eta. 
Okay, so um, the, the two is not so important here, but GC2 is uh, the basic idea is to take uh, the Q vector space um, spanned by such equivalence classes. Um, and, oh yes, and upon it, there is a differential which involves contracting all the edges in terms. If you have G, let's say E1, N, and the differential is the sum, I is one to that N. With hopefully the correct sign. Um, so this this graph here is the graph where you contract edge e i. So I don't know. For example, if you had um, if you had this graph, um, and we wanted to contract this this edge here, then we would get um, we would get uh, something like this. Perhaps not a very good example because it produces a, a tadpole. Right? Um, that actually can't happen. But anyway, that's just to illustrate what that edge contraction was. <laughs> anyway, so the definition um, due to Konsevich um, of graph homology, so H GC2 equals, oh, sorry, I forgot to say, of course, that this is a differential. So if you apply this twice, um, then uh, you get zero. And the reason for this is, is very simple. It is because if you contract um, an edge and then another edge, um, it doesn't depend on the order in which you contract. The contracting edges commute. And then the fact that it squares to zero is, is due to cancellations coming from the sign. So all the content of this is really in the, in the sign. Um, and the fact that um, Contracting edges is So Konsevich defines graph homology to be the kernel of D over the, in, the image of D as usual. And I, I, I like to think of this as a, a, a bi graded um, Q vector space. Um, so it has many possible gradings um, and, and Depending on circumstances, you may choose to do things differently. Um, one of the gradings is by what's called loop number or genus. Um, so this is HG, and this is the number of um, HG is is uh, the rank of these homology. The graph, which is a free Z module. So it counts the number of the number of independent cycles in the graph. In this case, two. Um, another grading is uh, the homological degree. Um, which is um, which is the number of edges minus twice the number of loops. And the two here is related to this two. two. This graph is zero, right? This graph is zero in the graph complex, yes. It was an example of, of contraction. So, um, I'll, I'll draw another line in there. It's not zero. This is zero, good point. On the right hand side, is zero. It's also zero. So, zero goes to zero. <laughs> but uh, this was an illustration of contraction. contraction. And it's called each other's Didn't want to do it all at the same time. It's sort of consistent. Yeah, it's, it's, it's consistent. <laughs> um, so um, uh, an, an inspiring and, and important um, result is from us um, it is the, the beautiful theorem that uh, H0 of GC2 is isomorphic to 
the dual of the grotten deep Reichmiller Lie algebra, which I'm afraid I'm not going to define. It sits in the title of the conference that I would have expected you've seen it before. Um, less important is the fact that the negative homology vanishes, um, but that gives us our first connection uh, between, uh, between these, these uh, uh, concepts here. So we know a bit more about, uh, be a little bit more precise. So an example of a non-zero element in the graph complex are the odd wheels. You take a wheel graph, um, we have two n plus one spokes. Um, and you can show that these are, these are non-zero. So uh, with some orientation, matter um, is non-zero. Um, it's closed. So if you, if you contract, um, in fact, any edge, you get something zero in the graph complex. And uh, these, these get non-trivial homology classes in H0. Um, so this was shown by uh, Rossi and Rebecca. And these wheel classes, I think, are the, the only completely explicit classes that you can sort of write down on a board that are not, say, in the memory of a computer somewhere. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong. The wheel classes are, are, are related to the generated, well, to the, to the, the, the known uh, elements here by, um, by the following statement that the odd wheels are dual to um, what are called the, the zeta elements, or Sule elements sometimes. Um, of, of GRT. Good. But the, the question remains, um, what, what is the, 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 the higher the higher degree homology of the graph complex? And I think it's fair to say that there's no completely convincing conjecture that um, that tells us what, what it means, what its structure is. There are lots of results, but um, there's no um, no statement that completely nails it down, in, in my opinion. Sorry, I'm struggling with this. Thank you very much. Thank you for putting me out of my misery. Um, right, so the next topic is the moduli space. So in order to get a, a better handle on the graph complex, which is pure combinatorics or pure homological algebra, shall we say, uh, it's, it's nice to put some geometry into the picture. So let me briefly introduce the space and the trough. But so moduli space of, of uh, metric graphs. I need to tell you what a metric graph is. Metric graph, so also known as a tropical curve, is, um, so it's, it'll be a, a finite connected graph like before, but it has some extra data. Metric means that each edge is given a length. Positive or zero. Some authors take the edges to be strictly positive. It doesn't make much difference. Um, they're weighted. So that means every vertex has a weight which is an integer greater than or equal to zero. And there's a very mild condition of stability, which we can sort of ignore uh, in the first instance. Um, and stability means that if you have a vertex of weight zero like this, it has to have at least three edges sticking out of it. <coughs> three. And if you have a vertex of um, 
of um, point one, then it has to have a vertex. Um, at least it has to have degree at least one, but then I'm taking connected, I'm going to take connected curves, connected graphs for the time being anyway, so it doesn't make much difference. Um, so G trop. equals, so the sort of lowbrow definition is to um, essentially so the moduli space of all, all such um, metric graphs at a fixed Newton number, a fixed genus. So we take weighted graphs G comma W, where um, HG equals G, stable. And we take the space of all possible edge lengths. <coughs> so this is the, the um, think of this as the, the space of all, all possible lengths associated to a graph. It's just a, 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 um, a product of R positive. And then, so each, each graph gives you a cell, and then we glue the cells together in a certain way, which I'll explain presently. So when you define genes for these graphs, do you count the weights as well? Um, yes. Count weights. Um, so it, it's HG, you're right. Sorry, my phone is wrong. HG um, um, so what is the formula? Can I remember the formula? It's the uh, it's the sum of the weights. Well, let me do it. So there's a formula involving that the sum of the, the, the loops plus the sum of the weights, which is the genus G. Plus, plus the sum of weights, because here you replace two edges with one with, with a unit of weight. And fast and instability. No, think of the weight as no. a net force. It's too yeah, so I'll explain. So um, let me just explain what this relation is and then explain what happens with the contraction. I think it should be, um, should be clear. I should have some space there. So, so this um, <coughs> equivalence um, is two things it's um, contraction of edges. What that means is that as, as one as an edge length uh, becomes physically of, of zero length, we think of that as being the same graph in which the, the edge has been physically contracted. And um, automorphisms or isomorphisms, I should say, of graphs. I'll, I'll explain these in just a second. So first contraction of edges. If you have um, uh, two, so there are two ways you can contract edges. If you have an edge here, E here, and the adjacent vertices have weights W1 and W2, then when you contract edge E, the new vertex acquires um, the sum of the weights. So the genus hasn't changed. Um, uh, in, in this picture, the sum of the weights is the same and there are no new loops. Um, however, when you contract a what's called a, a tadpole, now when we contract this edge, what happens is the weight goes up. So as, as uh, somebody just pointed out, um, which is beautiful, perhaps it's, it's correct. As someone just pointed out, that this way of really keeping track of, of loops which have disappeared upon contraction. So, so the, 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 the genus is literally the sum of the weights plus the um, So they're really a bookkeeping procedure for keeping track of top holes. And we don't see them in the graph complex. We'll see the lines. So let me draw a picture of, oops, just a small piece of MG trot to get an idea of it. 
Um, so let's look at um, this graph. And to make it a bit interesting, let's say that this has weight one and this has weight two. Um, so that's unfortunate. Let me let's, let me say a uh, weight of W one and W two. That's better. And edge one and edge two. <coughs> so each, each edge here has has a length L one. This has a possible length L two. And so the, the pairs L one L two uh, produces a, a quadrant positive quadrant like this. Um, and then when uh, the, the length of this edge goes to zero, so uh, that means we're on this axis, we identify the graphs with zero here as the graphs in which we physically contracted the edge. So this is two and now the weight is W1 plus W2. And, and the moduli space of edge lengths here is just the coordinate L2 corresponding to the length of this edge. Likewise, on, on this bottom edge here, we have um, the same thing, but with the other edge. And then finally, this point in the corner. So it's stratified, and, and the, the stratum here in the corner is um, just a single vertex. Um, it's just a, a graph with a single vertex and weighted W1 plus W2 plus 1. So that's how the, these cells that are just in Euclidean, uh, subspace of Euclidean space, glued together in a very simple way. And then the next um, thing one has to do is to take into account automorphisms of graphs. So the new fella, this graph here uh, has, has a symmetry which, which interchanges um, these two edges. And uh, that, that interchanges L1 and L2, which corresponds to reflection um, along this diagonal. Is one interchange with two. So I want to say that this L L one change with L two. Sorry, but this is only for equal weights, right? Or or oh, always. Always, yeah. Sorry, there's a there's a clash between the the indices there and the edges, which is unfortunate. Um, and so essentially, the space is is then the quotient by this group by this this action. So it's um. So quite an interesting structure. So when we take the quotient by this action, this axis gets identified with this axis. Um, and the lines on this diagonal uh, sort of uh, double points, um, if you like this, this covering is not a tau along the diagonal. And the quotient looks a bit like a folded, uh, a sort of folded napkin. Uh, like this. This is a piece of MG chalk, and it has this kind of stacky structure to it because you're hosting out by these finite groups everywhere. It's quite a subtle space. Isn't there also a symmetry where you flip along the vertical line, like you flip the vertices no. but not the edges? Um, um, no. So that's the identity. Oh, sorry, uh, it's with the wrong vertices. Um, no, I don't think so. Um, Not the identity because it flips. No, you're right, it flips the vertices. Yeah. Ah, yeah, in the case, it's certainly in the case where the weights are not equal, you could do that. But, um, but it does nothing on this modulized space, it acts trivially. <coughs> because we only care about the we only care about the edge length. So we only care about the action of the group of automorphisms on the sets of edges. So so when I say automorphisms of graphs, I really mean 
the image of the automorphisms in the symmetry group of the set of edges. So it's absolutely. Absolutely. Um, say. Oh yes. Um, so a small variant of this is um, L um, the link of the cone point. So this these spaces always have the sort of a cone. They have a, a cone point. Is this topologically they're not very interesting. If you delete the cone point and, and you can quotient by um, the action of R star, with, with R star positive, which scales all the edge lengths, you get something geometrically more interesting. And the simple way to, to think of this is, is just to take the same definition, but where you normalize the edge lengths um, to, to sum to one. So, so it would be, be like, you know, cut, cutting them all, all here somehow. Um, and that, that's a much more interesting space that's clearly very closely related to MG drop. <coughs> um, and so um, a result which I was perhaps known before this, but I learned of it in the paper of Cham, Galati, and Payne. Um, I hope I haven't misquoted this, uh, which is that the cohomology of the link of mg trop is related to um, the homology of graph complex in genus G. And, and there's some, some slightly funny shifts in degrees because um, the way homological degree is defined here, it doesn't quite correspond to, to the dimension here. So there's, there's just some messing about with indices. But the, the bottom line is that the homology of the graph complex can essentially be read off the homology of the space. It was definitely not known before then. Was it not? No. Okay. Um, well, it's, it's, it, there's some very uh, deep results in the, the paper. This is one of the easiest ones. Um, and it's not so surprising because clearly the way this space is built up is by this operation of contracting edges. So it's, if you think of cellular homology, um, each cell is sort of has, has trivial homology. The way they do it is exactly captured by this complex. Not too surprising. Okay, so I won't say more about that, but that connects. Um, that connects uh, these two layers. And now I want to do, um, do some differential geometry on this space. This is problematic because it's not, it's not a manifold. It's certainly not smooth in any sense. Um, it's piecewise uh, linear, but it's not a manifold. It has this stacky structure, which is not a big deal. But one has to do, to do differential geometry on it, one, one has to do something. And so what we're going to do is, is move now to, the, to, to GLN and use that to, to construct some differential forms and then study them on, on, on this space. So the connection with the general linear group is by what's called the tropical terrain map. So now let me take PG to be the space of positive definite symmetric matrices, uh, which are G by G. And upon it acts GLGZ. If I have a, a matrix called X, and I take, take a cuttable um, matrix of rank G with integer coefficients, then it acts upon X via um, X goes to P transpose XP. And the Torelli map, so this is an extreme classical space. And the Torelli map, it is, is a map 
um, between the moduli, uh, the moduli space of tropical curves and, and this symmetric space. It's slightly, what I said is slightly inaccurate. Um, <clears throat> um, in fact, the, the tropical threading map is more than that. I'm only going to consider its restriction <clears throat> for an open. So I'm going to look at the subspace Uh, the open subspace of where all vertices have weight zero. I'll draw a picture in a minute. And so I'm going to look at the, the, the restriction of the trading map. And it maps to this very classical symmetric space. And it does so as follows, it takes a, a metric graph. Now that the vertices don't have any weights, so they're, they're just unlabeled, they weights are zero, if you like. And to a graph, you associate a class of a certain symmetric matrix called the graph of Fassman. This is a symmetric. Um, G by G matrix. I'll define in a minute. Now, this space is interesting. Um, it's uh, extremely close to um, Color Wachmann's outer space modulo out FG. And they need to, there's a slight issue with taking links here or not, but I'm, I'm going to be a bit sloppy about that. Definition. Some, sometimes. In some contexts, people normalize the edge lengths, and in other contexts, people don't. That's just a detail. So, this is uh, the tropical Torelli map, G trop. So, to explain this, let me now um, tell you what the graph Laplacian is. Um, so, instead of giving a formal definition, since I'm slightly Behind, I will just um, work out an example. Simple, so I don't think. <laughs> so let's look at an example of the graph of Bastian. And the general picture would be similar. So let's take a graph. Um, Which is one, two, three. Um, and I'm going to orient the edges in some, some choice of orientation on the edges. It's not at all an orientation in, in the sense at the beginning of the lecture. Here I mean a, a, a direction on, on the edges. Then let's choose a, a basis of, of cycles. So one cycle would be C1, C2. So cycle one um, is edge one minus edge two. And cycle two is um, edge two minus edge three. We can always do this. And then we form uh, the incidence matrix. So there are lots of different types of incidence matrices for graph. The incidence is between edges and vertices or edges and loops or loops and vertices. So this is going to be between edges and, and loops, edges and cycles. So it's going to be um, a matrix which is EG by HG and um, its entries are the coefficients of uh, each edge in each cycle. So if we write this index of cycles along the top, you get um, one minus one, zero, um, zero, one. That encodes some of this data. And the graph Laplacian is HG transpose diagonal matrix.
well, in the, the diagonal matrix are given certain parameters alpha i, which, which correspond to edge lengths. I'm just I'm changing notation from L to alpha. Standard notation in energy physics. So when you can, when you compute this recipe, you find in this case that lambda g is a two by two matrix alpha one plus alpha two minus alpha two minus alpha two. Alpha two, alpha two. That's um, a um, symmetric matrix, obviously. Um, you can check it's in fact um, positive definite. I don't understand what are the alpha. What are the alpha? So the alpha, so alpha is, is uh, so alpha e is a, a parameter um, for each uh, edge of the graph. And I want to think of it as a coordinate on the space of edge lengths. So our alpha is the function which okay, so reads off the length of the corresponding edge. So you could just think of it as, as, as the length L if you prefer. But I want to do algebraic geometry, so I want to think of alpha, alpha as, as a variable in an affine space. <clears throat> but it's, it's really, um, uh, the, these are really the edge lengths. When we, when we restrict this to a metric graph, uh, this will be the, 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 the sum of the lengths of edges one and two. It's the length of edge two. But I want to think of this as an, as an abstract matrix with some formal parameters. And that's why I've changed uh, L to L. So then the observation is that the determinant of this the is, um, is, in this case, rather interesting because it gives a, a polynomial which only ever has positive coefficients. And this polynomial is very famous. It's called the Kirchhoff uh, polynomial, which was used in the 1850s. Kirchhoff study of electrical circuits because it, it computes the resistance of, of, uh, of a circuit of this nature. Now, I was once in an airplane and uh, the person sitting next, I was doing some calculations like this, and the person sitting next to me said, oh, are you an electrical engineer? And I said, uh, no. He said, oh, yeah, but you're calculating resistance on circuits. I was very impressed. It's used all the time in, in quantum field theory. Okay, so this matrix um, it is not well defined. Um, it has a change of basis formula. If we change, if we change the choices that go into this, then lambda g can transform. Um, by multiplication by an element of GLDZ. It's not completely well defined. But it's the time it is. So here's um, a quick picture of, <clears throat> of a piece of this space and, and the trolley map. So let's look at, let me look at now the link uh, uh, and a two trough. So we're looking at graphs with, with two loops. So I'm going to take this one. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> we don't, the, the, the vertices have weight zero, so I just don't bother to weight them at all. And remember that this is where you, you normalize the edge length. So um, we have. So uh, the cell associated with this graph is this um, simplex. All right, in, in uh, Euclidean simplex. Uh, and then when you contract one of the edges, you get the, um, the simplex of the graph, the corresponding graph where you contract. Now the corners, the corners correspond to contracting a further um, uh, edge, but they're tadpoles and, and they would morally give us uh, a, a vertex with a, a weight one. But in this, in this space, we don't consider that. 
So um, I'm, when we consider this trolley map, I'm not including uh, these corners. That's important. So um, on this space, we have um, so on, on this, this is open to every graph, to, to, to every point in this space. Uh, we associate uh, essentially the, the graph of classical matrix. Right. Ooh, keep this one. So now um, <clears throat> we're now on the symmetric space for GLN, which is of course important in theory of automorphic forms and so on. And I want to um, look at um, differential forms on this space and pull them back and study what happens here. So let me do that. Now the cohomology of, of GL, um, GLGZ is not known at all. Um, it's only been computed at a very small range. And uh, there's not even a conjecture for what it should be. In general, one expects some complicated automatic forms. But there is a, a subspace of so called invariant forms, which are very explicit. So I call these canonical forms. So given a, a symmetric matrix X, We can form omega nx equals trace x inverse dx. And that defines a differential form, which is closed. It is bi invariant. So if you take um, A, B, and G, L, G, in fact, much more strongly, you could take any real, um, then you find that um, omega and A, X equals omega and X, B, omega and X. So, so to make sense of this, we're, we're thinking of um, X is a, a matrix which is sort of moving around in the space of symmetric matrices. And so this defines a, a form. Here A and B are, are fixed, are fixed matrices. The word that their entries are constant. And then it, it's, it's true that, that this, um, this form is invariant on the left and the right. And the variance on the on the uh, on the left is obvious because um, you know if you multiply x inverse dx it is already left variant obviously. I know true. Um, yeah, so this is true for oh, yeah, this is actually true for any matrix. The definition works for any matrix, quite right. Um, and G by G, um, M in invertible. So in particular, you, you quite rightly point out, if, if X is, uh, um, when we restrict to symmetric matrices, R number N X, R number N P X P transpose. Uh, so the bi-invariance property is a stronger property, but it implies that these differential forms are well-defined on the quotient. So I'm going X is an N form, X, P, G, more zero, G, L, G, Z, Becky. Um, and they vanish 
matrices, they always vanish if um, n is even, and they vanish if n is congruent to three mod four when x is symmetric. <laughs> Functional forms that they're quite subtle, very, very hard to compute actually. Um, but the definition is completely um, easy. I think it's, it's uh, around the time of um, uh, Samuelson and Ray in the 1950s. Fantastic. So uh, let me form omega can be the graded exterior algebra. On, on the forms which we do have. So a lot of these vanish, but what we do have is omega 5, omega 9, omega 13. But those are certain, certainly differential forms on the space of symmetric matrices, and we can take wedge products of them. I leave out omega one because it's kind of badly behaved. Omega one doesn't have, um, for several different reasons, it doesn't have good properties, so I'm going to throw it away. And an extremely famous result in 1973 by Zohair, which I think is one of the most uh, important um, results in, in the theory of motors. Um, is that if you take the stable cohomology of GLG of the symmetric space, modular the action of GLGZ, it is exactly um, this graded exterior algebra of canonical forms. It says that if you're um, so we're interested in, in the stable cohomology. This is the only way you can write down um, uh, cohomology classes. <laughs> so, um, right, so back to this picture. We have this picture here. So, we have differential forms. On, on this space now, and I am going to uh, pull them back to um, this um, modulized top So I define omega G to be um, so this is T drop upper star. Omega G is uh, omega evaluated on the matrix lambda G. And that's perfectly well defined because of this fine band property. So, for examples of differential forms on MG trace, then are the trace, you take the Groff Laplacian inverse D Groff Laplacian. You raise it to the power of 4k plus one. That gives you a differential form on moduli space tropical curves. And you can take wedge products of these guys. Right, so I have 10 minutes, I believe. Starts, you know, for oh, sorry. Excellent talk. No, no, okay. no. Um, I think everyone is happy. To yeah, I'm just <laughs> so happy. I'm, I'm very sorry. Okay, I, I, uh, I should have read the program. Um, I'll, I'll be very, very quick indeed. I'll just uh, try to say. But that was a very good negotiation, right? <laughs> but that was a very good negotiation technology. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm going in there. So, the, the, so definition then 
We have an omega in omega tan of the correct degree. So that if I take a differential form with the degree eg minus one, and I take a graph g with eg edges, then I can integrate and form what I call integral. So basically I integrate over the cell of the link, just if you like, just the volume of a cell in this space or obviously with respect to this metric. Uh, oh, okay. And the theorem is um, a theorem is that this integral is always finite, always converges. Um, it, it's, it's what's called a Feynman integral. So it's of a certain shape. It's some numerator of a graph polynomial, some power. These occur everywhere in high energy physics. And they almost always diverge, which is why it's quite surprising that these are actually always finite. And they satisfy lots of algebraic relations that, res that respect the relations in the graph complex. Would you often find a good degree, right? Because now you explain to us that this is this is those exterior products, right? Yes. But then one would need like a, a good maybe eg minus one is not the sum of those four k plus points. It might not be, in which case like I can't, there's nothing to do. I just can't do anything. There is no okay, so then so be and, and that's that's because um you often don't expect graph cohomology in that degree, it just doesn't occur. Um, so yeah, let me see what I can, so actually all the actual results of my talk, so I actually skipped, it's a shame. Um, so maybe, you can we have planned for, we have a little bit of stuff. Really? I, I, I feel terrible because I'm gonna eat into the, okay, I'll, I'll try to summarize. Um, I want to, like to give some examples of these. Um, so a, a recent, recent theorem in progress with Oliver Schnetz um, is the calculation of these integrals on the wheels. And we find um, canonical integrals of the wheel graphs are some explicit rational number times a value of the Riemann zeta function. So um, that has a lot of consequences. I may just say in words in a second. We know all the wheel integrals now, and that builds on the actual integral calculation also uses work of, of Schneer. So I wanted to give an example of a relation. So we have um, the integral for the wheel with five spokes. Satisfies. Um, we have relations between these integrals, which come from relations in the graph complex. So this graph here is five spokes. This is something called the zigzag. And the reason is that if you take um, a 2z5 minus w5, then it's d of some other graph in the graph complex. So this relation shows up as a relation between integrals. And fascinatingly, uh, Schnetz and Borinsky calculated um, the canonical integral on, on the complete graph with six elements, with six vertices, omega five, which omega nine, and they found uh, an interesting multiple zeta in five, um, which is of course connected to GRT. So I think I've, I've done everything on this board. Um, so what is this second number, zeta of three, what? This is zeta three comma five. Oh. So it, it's some, some zeta three times zeta five, some zeta eight, some coefficients, but the, the, the interesting part is a, a, a multiple zeta value. So some linear combination. Of zeta. Um, so the, the wheels has a lot of consequences. It, it produces new cohomology classes in um, on the general linear group. 
um, it produces new cohomology in the moduli space of abelian varieties, which were not known. Um, and then other stuff. Skip all of that, I'm sorry. And I'll just formulate one um, conjecture to come full circle. The conjecture is we've seen from the wheels that the um, so this, this theorem gives another proof that the wheels are non-trivial in the graph complex. And it shows that they are somehow dual to these canonical forms. So if you want to extrapolate that, then one should expect not just the, 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 the generators on the five, nine, and so on to be in the graph complex, but all their wedge products as well. So this can now be in the cohomology of DC2. But the graph complex is a Lie algebra, so we should take the free Lie algebra on omega can. And so that should explain uh, a lot of the cohomology of GC2. Now, inside this is, and I, I will finish, inside this is the free Lie algebra generated by just the primitive canonical forms. And uh, in this conjecture, um, part of the statement is that this should actually land in zeroth cohomology GC2. So this is, a, if you like, a special case of this conjecture. And actually, this is a theorem. So let me explain why very quickly. So because um, the omegas are dual to the wheels, and the wheels are dual to the sigmas, this is isomorphic to sigma. Uh, the uh, um, uh, zeta elements, and by Thomas's result, this is isomorphic to GRT, and so this conjecture predicts that the three D algebra injects into GRT, and this was uh, conjectured by Delini in the nineteen nineties, and is uh, uh, known. It was proven about ten years ago. This part of the conjecture is true. And we can think of this as a, a generalization of Hidden's conjecture on, on GRT. Um, I'm terribly sorry for um, misjudging the length of the talk. Perhaps we could park questions to lunchtime or something. Anything otherwise? Yeah. Um, could you say, right? What about the gradient, right? Probably this uh, injection also predicts uh, the, the, grade, the, the, the degree, the chemology, right? Of, uh, uh... This is very strange, actually. So, so this conjecture is slightly misleading because um, I don't think that this map is induced by the term. So, something very weird happens is that you have. Um, you have mg trot and it maps to space called ag trot, which is a moduli space of tropical abelian varieties, uh, and then the symmetric space. And what happens is that th this, this should really appear in the cohomology in this intermediate space in exactly the right place. All cohomology classes are where you predict. But when you go between these two spaces, there's some transgressions. So um, in other words, this map is actually zero on a lot of the cohomology, but the classes here shop in the wrong places. So I can't predict the, the degree here. I can predict things about the degree, constraints and, and parity conditions, but it's very bizarre that these classes show up in, in the wrong places in, in GC2 um, in a way that seems hard to predict. Can you cannot predict the length of the zigzag? Or no, so the zigzag is, is something else. So, so um, in AG, these guys should appear in, in, in the right degree, meaning you you, you see the genus by, by looking at these forms, the first place these forms can live. The cohomological degree is the sum. And uh, in the graph complex, you'll find that, that that is outside the known range of the cohomology. And so there should be some zigzag relations, which are not quite the same ones that the ones I think you're thinking of which then just move the classes just a little bit. So for these classes, they occur on the nose in the right degree. So two way class, you just shift by one. 
but sometimes you shift by three or four it's very mysterious so that explains why the cohomology here is, is very uh, strange because these glasses are, are, are slippery they there's a filtration and not a grading that it respects the very good question yes what about odd graph complex? Odd graph complex. Uh, Do you have any intuition? Um, no, I don't. Um, so there's, there's some work in progress on, on, on this one that I'd be happy to discuss, um, but very early days. Um, uh, no. no maybe can we have a, uh, maybe first speaker again? Mm -hmm.